We only have about 15 minutes to lunch, um, and Skip Palinek is our last presenter, and I would like to thank him because he graciously yielded the majority of his time for the remaining, for the other, pa other panel members, um, and especially our international colleagues who have traveled this far. Um, Skip has promised me that he will do this presentation in its entirety, both at the upcoming joint meeting in Orlando and possibly at the next symposium. So thank you, Skip, for graciously yielding your time. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. It's, uh, again, with the amount of time, it's not, uh, it's not really worth your effort to, to listen to a, a Benny Hill type version of <laughs> zipping through it here. Um, but I did want to say uh, just a couple of things, uh, uh, since I've got a pulpit here for the moment. Um, the technique that I was going to be talking about here is not new. Anybody who knows me knows my great disdain for uh, flow charts. Uh, what I present here is a flowchart, the first version of which actually was published uh, back in uh, 19, uh, around 1985 at the, when the International Association of Forensic Sciences meeting was held in Oxford. I presented it, uh, I presented it then. Since then, it's gone through multiple iterations, um, the most recent um, being, uh, well, next most recent being in Ray Murray's most recent but um, evidence from the earth there's a version in there and the, the most recent and something you might want to get a hold of if you do forensic soil examinations is Maria Mange who many of you know from her uh, heavy minerals in color which is now a, a great collector's item the last edition I saw that was available was four hundred ninety five dollars on, uh, on Abe looking for it but uh, that price is going to go down because she is getting her new edition ready so that'll be up but anyway in the meantime she published Big thick book by Elsevier, heavy mineral. Or excuse me, applications of heavy minerals, and then there is a, a chapter by me on the applications of uh, uh, heavy minerals or to forensic science, and it, it includes these flow charts as well. So, why is, what's the purpose of the flow chart? The flow chart is not to examine uh, soil in a case. That's that's not the point at all. It's to teach people. I worked these methods out, and based on standing on the shoulders of others, of course. Um, to try and get the most information possible from the smallest sample. Uh, typically, we get just little bits, especially if you take consistent samples from an object. You might look at a pair of shoes, and you've got maybe eight different little tiny samples all around that. You've got to work with those. The most challenging sample I ever worked with, and I know she's in the room right now, um, I met a police officer who had sent us some work on a case in Livermore. Uh, she was introduced, actually, by, uh, by Pat Grant. but. She, she didn't know how to take samples uh, at that point, now she does, but she took little swabs from the wheel wells of the car and cotton swabs. But we were still able to do something with those um, by scaling things down, and that's one of the advantages of this, of this approach. It's to try and utilize everything that soil can tell you in sort of a proper um, sequence. But again, every soil you get, or sand sample or, or dust um, material, is a challenge in itself. Most of um, what all of you do, and, and a great deal, at least in the past, of what I used to get is, is the, our comparisons. That's what most people are involved in. Uh, my personal professional interest my whole life has been in geosourcing. Um, you heard yesterday about a very nice uh, piece of geosourcing work that was done um, following those, uh, some of those same, uh, uh, same principles by, by Andy and others who uh, are here in the audience. Um, those methods can be of great benefit. It is really, a, 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 I don't know how to describe it, a, a great analytical challenge and one of the most interesting intellectual challenges to be able to take a bit of dust or a thimble full of soil or a small amount of a mud stain or something and without ever having been to the location in your life to be able to trace it back to its source. And yet all that information is there. Everything I read when I was a kid growing up and reading about, reading Max Fry, about Max Freisels and finally studying with him and working for Dr. Macron and so forth and some of the other great names that I've met or, or only know through having studied their works um, as I was growing up. Everything tells you that you should be able to do this. And in fact, you can. Um, I published uh, my first sort of comprehensive comprehensive version of this um, in the late uh, uh, 70s. Those of you who have ever read my chapter on the de determination of geographical origin of dust samples in the uh, volume five of the, of the particle atlas um, will we'll know what I'm talking about. I try to bring a lot of these uh, things together. Um, that is 
with some of the talk we've had this week about uh, the survival of trace evidence as a, uh, as a discipline, I think one of the things that we can do to ensure our own survival in this is to uh, think again about going back and being analysts and not just comparators, actually figuring things out, Vinny's talk and identifying unknowns and so forth. That, there's great intellectual um, cheeriness <laughs> in doing those sorts of things. Learning about things, having exact knowledge of things is something I would highly recommend. It, uh, it takes a lot of time, but what else are you going to do with your time? You know, squander it on, you know, playing gambling or something? I mean, I don't know. Maybe for some people that's probably, probably a new thing. But there, there's a lot, uh, lot you can learn. Um, almost everything in a dust sample or extrapolating it to a larger and sometimes you get more information from a soil sample um, tells you something about the soil. Um, as I say, this technique, although we don't use it in casework, it's for teaching, is it, it, it'll, it permits you to look at each of these in sort of the purest states. So we separate out the pollen fraction, for example, and look at that. And one of my teachers, my second teacher of palynology is in the room here, so he has workshop, Vaughn Bryant. He's, he can do fantastic things with pollen, and it goes beyond just identifying the pollen. Um, you can look at uh, heavy minerals. Uh, I've had a number of cases which I present over the years where we track things down by the, by the heavy minerals and the other components of the, of the sample. The um, uh, quartz grain surface textures, this, this goes back to the very early days. In the 60s, people were trying to look at quartz grain surface textures. They, were, they didn't have very good methods for doing it. They make replicas by, when you look at them by TEM. SCN came out, Crinsley and others immediately jumped on that, and they've tr done tremendous work. Granted, they're looking at ancient environments. We can, we can work with those in modern environments. We can scale it down the size. They typically, if you go back to Crinsley's work or uh, some of the others who followed him, they're saying you need the 250 micron and stuff like that larger. You can, you can in fact, work on some of the smaller grains with the instruments we have available and do, uh, do that kind of work. You can, even something as insignificant seeming, which typically I've never found a case where it's been important in comparison, but even the clay, the clay on the surface of uh, grains and so forth, uh, that you, you sonicate off of those can give you a great, deal, diff, a great deal of information about an environment. When you put, put all this together, it's almost like somebody, you know, reading a storybook to you with a happy ending. Everything fits into place in the end, and you'd be surprised. Um, sometimes all you can say is we can describe a location, let's say that you've never been to. But in many cases, and we've demonstrated that, you can take this material and, uh, like you say, read it like a book. The pollen gives you a lot of information about the flora in the region, things that belong in, and don't belong, especially the airborne pollen. But again, we heard a lot about um, uh, Anomophilus pollens, the ones that you have to brush against. Well, that shows intimate contact with the, with the actual plant. Somebody's rolling around in the ground in a dandelion patch. Well, you've got dandelion pollen over your clothes. But you can walk through that patch and vacuum your shirt, and you, you're lucky if you see a dandelion grain, something like that. So there's all this, uh, all this place for really using what Kirk Hall, when I was reading his book when I was a kid, you know, using your scientific imagination as well. Taking it, first of all, all this, of course, relies on firm, solid identification. And to do that in many cases, in the best way possible, you need to isolate various fractions of things. Secondly, once these are identified, you might not always be the best person to identify for that matter. You might have to take it to other people. That's why I can take my pollen ID so far. Go beyond that, I go to Vaughn. He knows, he knows that. Uh, and the same for other kinds of things. But then after that, if you're trying to learn something, where it came from, all this does in fact tell you a story. And it's, I'm sure many people in this room could think of things more intellectually interesting than this, but for me, you know, solving a problem, it's just the, the pure beauty of, and not, by, and not by psychic powers or anything, taking yourself from a thimble full of dust and being able to transport yourself to an actual location and see it is just, is, and then and then they have it actually come true. I once gave somebody who was uh, asking me to do this a photograph out of a, uh, a geography book, a color picture of a location. Uh, this, is, this is what the place looks like that this sample came from. And when they presented that to the people who would hire them to do this work, they showed that picture right next to the picture of the actual site, which I eventually got to go out and visit like that. But. Um, you know, some of these things, we, we, if you love science, like I, as I do, 
Um, you know, don't sell yourself short, and don't be afraid of trying to help investigators. I think one of the things that frustrates investigators a lot, in my experience, is they come into the lab and they say, we've got this, what can you do with it? And people say, well, bring us something to compare, and we'll, we'll uh, you know, look at it, and see what we can do. So we have nothing to compare, we just got this. That's all, that's all we've got here. And uh, in many cases, it is possible to give them useful information, but requires that you show the dedication, which, which I'm sure 98% of the people in this room have, to be able to go ahead, do the analytical work, the solid work, um, build it up, rest all your, you know, all this rests first of all on a firm foundation. That's the absolute scientific parts testable by others. They can get the same conclusion. But then don't be afraid in an, an investigative sense to use your imagination to try and help an investigator find, you know, what kind of glass this could be or where that soil could come from or, or what kind of object these fibers could originate from. Those are not beyond the realm of possibility and I would highly encourage all of you who love what you do and I think most everybody in this room does, you wouldn't be here otherwise. Well, you might, well, no, those people are at the beach right now. So everybody here <laughs> <laughs> likes it. To, you know, to pursue that. I think it's a wonderful endeavor. I think it's one way of helping to ensure that as a discipline, uh, those of us who love trace evidence um, will continue to find, uh, you know, samples that come in to satisfy our curiosity for problem solving. So, uh, anyway, it's not the talk I was supposed to give, but if you want, you want, you come in two years, I guess I'll give that, maybe even a workshop, we'll do another workshop, or um, come to Cassandra's uh, joint meeting. Uh, in Florida later in the year. But thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy your lunch and the great program to follow. Thank you, sir.